Okay, so hello everybody and welcome to the Sutta class for today. <laughs> and for today's class we're going to be looking at Madhyama Nikaya number 152, the Indriya Bhavana Sutta, the development of the faculties. Uh, again, uh, talking as with all the, the suttas in this chapter, talking about the uh, six senses, Samayatana, and again as with all the uh, suttas in this chapter, uh, having a parallel in the Salayatana Sanyutta of the uh, Sarvastivadan Sanyukta Agama preserved in the Chinese translation and not having any parallels uh, elsewhere in the Majjhima or anywhere else. This particular one, however, also has a few uh, fragments preserved in Sanskrit uh, from the findings in Turfan. Okay, let's have a look at the sutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at, in Kajangala in a grove of Mukhelu trees. One of the interesting things, this is a very unusual kind of location, if you look in the uh, uh, version we have here, we have Gajangala instead of, Wikipedia has Kajangala. So we have a different spelling there and we also have the Suweluane. In the in the beautiful bamboo grove, in the beautiful bamboo grove, whereas this one has the in a grove of mukelu trees. So we have mukelu rather than so that's quite different. Uh, Analio notes this uh, in his comparative study. Uh, in the Burmese version, we have the suwelu grove at Gajangala. The uh, Sinhalese version has the mukelu grove at Kajangala. And the uh, Thai edition has a Veluwana, a bamboo grove at Gajangala. Um, and in the one of the Sanskrit fragments, uh, we have fragments which probably spell something like Ingalayang, Ingalayang, Ingalayang. Uh, and uh, according to, uh, uh, so there seems to be considerable confusion as to the actual uh, location of this. Um, uh, the, 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 the Chinese parallel um, uh, seems to be similar to the, trans to the location as given here in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Um, uh, according to the Vinaya uh, Kajangala, if this is indeed Kajangala, formed the eastern boundary of the middle country. So, uh, was kind of, if if they, and if that's the case, then this would have been to the to the very far east of the Buddha's uh, journeys. Uh, and we've looked at the um, looked at the map a number of times, uh, but this would be uh, Kajangala would be something like. Um, if if um, if Magadha is here, Rajigaha, the last discourses in Rajigaha, Mithila, Kapilavattu, Savatthi, so the Buddha's main area of wandering was around here, occasionally going up as far as the Kuru country up here, and occasionally going down as far as Avanti down here, down the down the southern road. So occasionally going up the northern road and occasionally going down the southern road. And this one, if it's on the easternmost boundary of the um, our middle country, then we have here Anga and Champa. This is the normal sort of easternmost lands that the Buddha sort of went to. And uh, so, so probably somewhat further east than that, around about here, would have been you know, probably where the discourse was. And again, if, if it was really so remote, then that might explain why there's a, a bit of confusion about the names. Yeah, and perhaps the uh, wasn't a very well-known place, and there might have been a, a different dialect might have even been spoken there, which might account for some of the confusion in the name. Okay, 
Then the Brahman student Uttara, a pupil of the Brahman Parasarya, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down on one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Uttara, does the Brahman pra pa Parasarya teach his disciples the development of the faculties, Indriya Bhavana? He does, Master Gautama. But Uttara, how does he teach his disciples the development of the faculties? Here, Master Gautama, one does not see forms with the eye. One does not hear sounds with the ear. That is how the Brahman Parasarya teaches his disciples the development of the faculties. If that is so, Uttara, then a blind man and a deaf man will have developed faculties according to what the Brahman Parasarya says. For a blind man does not see forms with the eye and a deaf man does not hear sounds with the ear. When this was said, the Brahman student Uttara, Parasarya's pupil, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. It, it was a fairly easy takedown, though, wasn't it? I mean, he was, he was asking for it, really. He couldn't have, he couldn't have uh, resisted. But he's obviously uh, he's obviously quite uh, emotionally invested in that, uh, and, and and who who knows uh, you know it may be uh, we have you know could well have been the case that uh, Uttara was didn't really understood the uh, Parasarya's teaching. Uh, I'm not aware of any particular teaching like that in the uh, Brahman scriptures. So anyway. Knowing this, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, the Brahman Parasarya, teaches his pupils the development of the faculties in one way, but in the Noble One's disciple, the Arya Vinaya, the supreme development of the faculties is otherwise. Now is the time, Blessed One, now is the time, Sublime One, for the Blessed One to teach the supreme development of the faculties in the Noble One's discipline. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. Then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied, and the Blessed One said this. Now, Ananda, how is there the supreme development of the faculties in the Noble One's discipline? Here, Ananda, when a bhikkhu sees a form with the eye, there arises in him what is agreeable, there arises what is disagreeable, there arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus. There has arisen in me what is agreeable, there has arisen in me what is disagreeable, and what is both agreeable and disagreeable. But that is conditioned, gross, dependently arisen and this is peaceful this is sublime that is equanimity the agreeable that arose the disagreeable that arose and the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him and equanimity is established just as a man with good sight having opened his eyes might shut them or having shut his eyes might open them so too concerning anything at all the agreeable the disagreeable or the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called in the Noble One's Disciple, this is a Noble One's Discipline, the supreme development of the faculties regarding forms cognizable by the eye. Interesting, I mean, it's, what's interesting about that is is that the Buddha's emphasis on the, the the ease of being able to do it? Yeah, just just as easy as being able to open your eyes or close your eyes, and the same way that you can establish equanimity regarding things that you're seeing. So he's saying that. Uh, they, they, so in in so in using that simile, I'm not aware of that particular simile being being used in this context elsewhere. So he's he's clearly um, drawing on uttaras earlier statement about the, the blind person having uh, having developed faculties uh, but in in reality of course we have uh, developed faculties in our senses which actually we, we learn from and which we use and so on but we have a control over them so you can open and shut your eyes it's not that you're blind but you can look if you want to or don't look if you want if you don't want to and so the same way spiritually that when you're developing your mind and trying to overcome unwholesome tendencies in your mind that you can you have just as much ability to be able to let go of those things just as rapidly, just as easily, and establish equanimity.
so too, when a bhikkhu hears a sound with his ear, there arises what's agreeable and disagreeable and so on, he, he uh, understands thus, equanimity is established, just like a strong man might easily snap his fingers, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable or disagreeable that arose cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is the supreme development of the faculties regarding sounds cognizable by the ear. And similarly, when smelling an odour with the nose, uh, he will establish equanimity just like raindrops on a slightly sloping lotus leaf roll off and do not remain there. So to concerning anything at all, the agreeable or disagreeable, or both agreeable and disagreeable that arose, they cease just as quickly. Now it seems clear that the first two similes are connected with the relevant senses. Yeah? The simile about the visual restraint is connected with opening and shutting your eyes. The simile about the restraint of the ears is connected with the clicking of your fingers. So I wonder whether the... Oh, I guess the, the lotus idea is the, the smell of the lotus. That's why it's connected with the, the sense of smell. Yeah. So you abandon the, the delightful smell of the lotus just like it would fall off. I guess. Makes sense. Okay. Again, and under when a bhikkhu tastes a flavour with the tongue, there arises in what's agreeable, what's disagreeable, both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands thus an equanimity is established. Just as a strong man might easily spit out a ball of spittle collected on the tip of his tongue, so too concerning anything at all, uh, he establishes equanimity. This is the supreme development of the faculties regarding flavours cognizable by the tongue. Again, Ananda, when a bhikkhu touches a tangible with the body, he establishes equanimity just as if a strong man might flex, extend his flexed arm or flex his extended arm. So too, the equanimity is established uh, just as easily. Again, and under when a bhikkhu cognizes a mind object with the mind, there arises in what's agreeable, what's disagreeable, both, both agreeable and disagreeable. He understands this and establishes the equanimity, just as if a man were to let two or three drops of water fall on, a, on an iron plate heated for a whole day. The falling of the drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too, concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose, cease just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. This is called, this is called in the Noble One's discipline, the supreme development of the faculties regarding ideas cognizable by the mind. And that's how there is the supreme development of the faculties in the Noble One's discipline. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, go from there over to the uh, comparative study and we'll have a look at how the uh, Chinese one uh, might be similar or differ. Does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, uh -huh. So have a look at some of the Pali terms here. Um, so the... Just in, in, curious, interesting detail, the, the blind person is the Andho and the deaf person is Badhiro. Deaf, that not being a word that's very common, blind one is fairly common, but deaf, Badhiro. A bad hero. Badhiro. Okay, so... Um, yeah, yeah, I'm coming to it. One second. Uh, Okay, so here's the agreeable manapa. Mm. Amanapa, upanang, manapa, 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 manapa. It's yeah, very closely related, yeah. But but but, but, but Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is good enough. It's agreeable, but more, it, it basically means pleasant. Yeah. It don't come to wish wish for desirable. Desirable might be better. Desired, amanapa, undesirable, both desirable and undesirable. But that is conditioned. 
coarse and penitently originated. And this is peaceful, this is sublime, that is to say, equanimity. It's quite a high praise of equanimity, really, because, I mean, the Buddha, that particular phrase, etang santang, etang panitang, the Buddha usually used for nibbana. But this is obviously talking about quite a high development of equanimity. The Buddha says it's the aryasavinaye anuttara indriya bhavana, the unexcelled development of the faculties in the noble one's discipline. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, so to the uh, parallel um, uh, comparative study uh, from Venerable Analia's text. The Indriya Bhavana Sutta and its Sangyukta Agama parallel report in similar ways that the Brahman youth Uttara, on being asked how he had been instructed with regard to the development of the faculties, explained that his teacher recommended to avoid seeing forms with the eye and hearing sounds with the ear. In both versions, this proposal meets with the rebuttal that in this case the blind and deaf would be accomplished practitioners. Um, A uh, slight difference is that in the Pali version, the, only the Buddha mentioned the blind one, whereas the Ananda brought up the deaf person. Um, the uh, uh, Uttara's um, silent dismay on hearing the Buddha's reply uh, is not mentioned in the Sangyukta Agama version. Um, And this introductory narration, uh, interestingly enough, also recurs as a discourse quotation in the Vibhasha translation. So this is the Vibhasha is the Sarv, the, uh, the great Sarvastivadan commentarial um, uh, text, which agree with the the Sangyukta Agama version, as one would expect, because the Sangyukta Agama is also Sarvastivadan. Uh, they agree with that that this remark about the deaf was made by Ananda. Um, uh, and Analia further goes on to note that uh, Bronkhorst, in an essay in, in 1993, sees a contradiction between this criticism of the development of the faculty through avoiding sights and sounds proposed by Uttara's teacher and the approving attitude shown in other discourses toward deeper states of concentration during which sights and sounds are no longer experienced. Yet the point made in the present discourse is how to relate to everyday experience. In fact, the expression development of the faculties, Indriya Bahavan, is an obvious counterpart to restraint of the factory, fa restraint of the factories, or even the faculties. Indriya Sangvara, thus the present package, passage is not a criticism of deeper states of concentration through which sensory experience is absent, but rather a criticism of attempting to deal with sensory impact during daily life by simply trying to avoid it, instead of developing equanimity towards whatever is experienced. Uh, so this is uh, I just just kind of make a note of that because that's um, that's an argument which you do hear from time to time, and uh, it, it it to me I mean it's quite astonishing as as you all know I've I've you know studied and learnt a lot and have a lot of respect for people scholars who who do take the Buddha's teaching seriously and put a lot of time into it, but I also find it frequently and normally completely astonishing how that they can completely mess up very simple and obvious things. I mean, it seems to me that's a completely obvious point. This is not talking about a deep state of meditation. It's obviously talking about, like we said, mentioned in the previous sutta, going for arms round or something like that. Uh, and uh, so for Bronkhorst, who is a, uh, in many ways a great scholar, to make that kind of elementary mistake uh, really is um, you know, quite telling. And that kind of mistake is... You find it very often in scholars and people who are not actually practicing uh, the Dhamma. So it's important to, to bear that in mind. And the reason for mentioning it is not to particularly criticize Bronkhorst or even particularly because it's a, a very important point. I don't think anybody here would make that same mistake. But the important thing to do is to bear it in mind that when you're reading uh, scholarly work on Buddhism, even though we can learn things from it, but just to maintain a you know a bit of a critical eye with it, that remember that most of the scholars are not meditators. Some are, um, but there's there's just as many silly uh, ideas that you find in scholastic uh, circles as you find anywhere else, and they sort of somehow get traction because I don't know where they were published or the influence of the uh, author and so on. Uh, and you shouldn't feel um, kind of uh, uh, you shouldn't feel um, inadequate or um, uh, you shouldn't feel sort of timid 
to challenge those kinds of ideas when they when they come up. So what was his mistake again? He, well, he he notes that in this case the Buddha criticizes the idea that you, that sense restraint means you don't see and hear things, whereas other other places in the sutra it seems to praise deep states of meditation where you don't see or hear things, and so Bronkhorst seems to think that that's a uh, contradiction. Uh, so, like in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, for example, where where the Buddha is sitting and then doesn't hear the the sound of the uh, the lightning storm and so on, uh, and so Bronkhorst thought that that was a contradiction, um, whereas in fact, fairly obvious, they're talking about two two quite different things. Yeah. Bronco, I mean, Bronkhorst is one of the uh, he's a German scholar, but he's one of the ones who's who's done. Uh, uh, research in specifically into meditation states in early Buddhism and how they relate to uh, Jaina practices and so on. Part of the context of that argument was was noticing the difference between the Buddhist and Jaina approach to uh, sense restraint and these kinds of things, which is actually along the lines of what you see here. Right, the Buddhist approach is always not knowing how to deal skillfully and respond to sense sense response, whereas uh, the Jain attitude obviously is quite different. Okay, so moving on. Um, uh, following a request by Ananda, so back to Venerable Analio's uh, comparative study, the Buddha then expounded his approach to the development of the faculties. In both discourses, this approach covers three aspects, though the two versions present these three aspects in a different sequence and under different headings. The first of these three aspects in the Pali version is the supreme development of the faculties, Anuttara, Indriya, Bahavana, which depicts how to establish equanimity in regard to sense experience that's agreeable, disagreeable, and both agreeable and disagreeable. In each case, one should know that such, such experiences are conditioned and gross, whereas equanimity is refined and peaceful. The Pali version applies the same to each of the six senses and depicts this way of handling experience at each sense door with a set of similes. These similes illustrate the swift establishing of equanimity at each sense door in the following manner, as we've already seen. And the eye is opening and closing the eyes, the ear uh, uh, is snapping one's fingers, the nose is water rolling off a lotus leaf, the tongue is spitting out a glob of spit, the body is flexing or stretching one's arm, and the mind is water dropping onto a heated plate and evaporating quickly. Um, the Indri, the Sangukta Agama version has a similar treatment, uh, so it has a, it has a similar the, the the actual teaching is very similar, but it, in its Sangukta it's the second topic, not the first topic, although it introduces this under the heading of being a different heading of being a noble one with developed faculties rather than being the uh, unexcelled uh, uh, development of the faculties. The Sangyukta Agama version's presentation also differs in its use of the image of water drops that fall onto, into a heated pan as it employs this simile to illustrate the establishment of equanimity at the body sense door, uh, while the Madhima Nikaya applies this to the mind. In the case of establishing equanimity at the mind sense door, the Sangyukta Agama instead uses the example of beheading a palmyra tree, a palm tree. It's interesting. Yeah, certainly the um, that one. Well, if, when you come to the the yeah that one, I guess it's it's less obvious how that one relates directly to the mind. I mean, you know, water drops falling onto a hot plate and getting evaporated. If you like, yes, of course, you can use that as an analogy for the mind. But it's not so obvious why it's the mind specifically. Um, but anyway. Uh, so, Venerable uh, uh, Analia has quite a, a long and interesting footnote here uh, about the uh, establishment of equanimity in regard to pleasant or unpleasant experiences. And a counterpart to this is found in the Jaina text, the Aryang, Ari, Ayaranga, Ayaranga, which instructs to avoid being attached to or developing any desire towards agreeable or disagreeable sense experiences. Um, and uh, he gives the text here uh, from Watanabe, which actually is quite interesting for someone studying Pali. But anyway, the text in Arad Magadhi. Uh, and the translation is, If a creature with ears hears agreeable and disagreeable sounds, it should not be attached to or delighted with, nor desiring of, nor infatuated, nor covetous of, nor disturbed by the agreeable or disagreeable sounds. 
The text continues by pointing out that given that it is not possible to avoid hearing sounds, a monk should avoid desire or aversion towards them. Okay, so it says, Nasaka nasong sadda. So it's not possible to avoid hearing sounds. And uh, Watanabe, the Japanese scholar who edited the text, notes that the title of the treatment is Bhavana, being similar to the current text in the Pali. Compared to the Pali version, the difference is that the Jain text begins its treatment with what is heard through the ear before turning to what's seen through the eye, the nose, the tongue, the body, a difference which is a recurrent feature in Jaina texts. Okay, so the, the, the Jain texts usually start with the ear instead of the eye, which is kind of a curious difference. If you look at the similar uh, listings of the senses in the Upanishads and Brahmanical texts, there doesn't seem to be a standard list in the early uh, period, pre-Buddhist period, uh, and indeed uh, you don't find the you, you find the senses kind of mixed up with other things in curious ways, like say the senses will be in a list along with you know you have eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, breath, uh, intention faith, volition, body, and so on, all in one list. So there's no kind of, there's not the same clarity, conceptual, categorical clarity that you find in the Pali texts. Of course, you find that later on, but not in the early Upanishads. Um, uh, going back to Analia's footnote here about the Jain text, uh, that the that uh, is explained by another scholar, McHugh, uh, as uh, probably reflecting Jain cosmology, whereas the Buddhist sequence appears to be based on analysis of the nature of perception based on the relation between the perceiver and the perceived, the eye being given pride of place during it to, due to its being the most far-reaching organ. I mean, I think that's interesting, and I think there are interesting reasons why the eye is always first in Buddhist um, uh, uh, Buddhist um, <coughs> text, I think there's something more fundamental to it rather than it's just being the most far-reaching. I mean, yes, it is the most far-reaching, but I think there's, I think there's something much more um, ingrained about us and possibly about uh, higher mammals or primates is that, 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 that sight is our, you know, our dominant sense. I mean, we have moved our eyes to the front of our head, uh, developed um, uh, uh, 3D vision, and there's something I think very powerful about the notion of of light, uh, of light meaning knowing. When when the dawn comes up, and if you're in the darkness in the forest, then you know things, you can see things, you understand things, and then darkness meaning ignorance. And I think that's hardwired into the human brain at a fundamental evolutionary level. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, but there is that difference. So the Jain text on on the uh, uh, sense restraint is very similar to the Pali, but do notice that slight difference also. It says that because it's not possible to not hear sounds or see sights, where the Jain text is sort of almost like saying, well, we kind of really wish that it was possible, right? We, we, the world would be a better place if we never had to saw, see or hear anything, uh, whereas you don't really find that in, in, in Buddhism. Uh, and elsewhere, of course, in a Jaina text, that the uh, having sense experience is, of course, the uh, uh, result of karma, which is to be burnt off. And so you sort of deliberately subject yourself to painful sense experience in order to burn off your past karma. Okay. Okay, so the um, the I'll just uh, do on here is the different uh, sequence of ideas that we find in the two versions. So in the Pali version, we have the first one is uh, equanimity, the sense experience. The second one is disgust. And see agreeable, and that we're, we're going to be moving on to these ones. We haven't seen them yet. See agreeable, agreeable as disagreeable. So that's the sequence in the Pali. And 
the sequence in the Sarvasti Varden version um, is is um, number one is C agreeable is disagreeable number two is equanimity number three Okay, so that's the different sequences in the two suttas. Okay, so the part we've 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 looked at this first section, the equanimity, which is the first in the Pali and the second in the Sarvasivadan, and we're about to go on to the other two sections. I find it quite only for this third method. Uh-huh. Which is equanimity of practice. Uh -huh. Because usually with uh even the mind in, in a training it's mm -hmm. quite a lot of aversion that is uh, it works with Right. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I, I, I also would agree that, that that's a uh, the sequence is somewhat problematic. So you're suggesting that we have a sequence like this, the Dhammananda sequence, and the last one is equanimity. Something like that. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would agree that would seem more 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 logical. Um, and uh, certainly it's normally the case that equanimity is, is usually the last thing, it's the outcome. Yeah? And the Buddha says this is the anuttara indriya bhavana, yeah? this is the highest development of the faculties, again, which would suggest that it should be the last one, just like the fourth jhana is the anuttara citta, is the unexcelled mind. So uh, but let's let's go on a bit further and let's see what the comparative, what the sutta says and what the comparative study says. And uh, we'll see uh, whether that sheds any more light on this. Okay. How, Ananda, is one a disciple in higher training, one who has entered upon the way? Here, Ananda, when a bhikkhu sees a form with an eye, hears a sound with the ear, smells an odor with the nose, tastes a flavor with the tongue, touches a tangible with the body, cognizes a mind object with the mind. And by the way, the Pali Sutta has never addressed the question of synesthesia which would be an interesting one here Bhikkhu sees a form with the ear <laughs> hears a sound with the eye anyway um, there arises in him what is agreeable what is disagreeable both agreeable and disagreeable he's ashamed humiliated and disgusted by the agreeable that arose by the disagreeable that arose and by the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose okay so um, so that's quite a strong reaction. Um, okay, so the, the explanation that Bhikkhu Bodhi gives is that the, the seka, the one who's on the higher training, so this of course refers to a stream enterer or higher, stream enterer, once returner or non returner, uh, he's still prone to uh, uh, subtle stakes of liking, aversion, and dull indifference in regard to sense objects. He experiences these, however, as impediments to his progress and thus becomes repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by them. And how Ananda is a noble one with developed faculties. Here, Ananda, when a bhikkhu sees a form with the eye, he hears a sound with the ear, 
smells an odor with the nose or tastes a flavor with the tongue or touches a tangible with the body, cognizes a mind object with the mind, there arises in him what's agreeable, what's disagreeable, what is both agreeable and disagreeable. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive? He abides perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive. If he should wish, may I abide perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive? He abides perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive. That may I abide perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive and the unrepulsive. He abides perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive and the repulsive. And if he wishes, may I abide perceiving the Am I, I'm going to make getting confused here. May I avoiding anyway? I think you get the idea. May I abide perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive and the repulsive? So you can see the, and then if he should wish, may I, avoiding both the repulsive and unrepulsive, abide in equanimity, mindful and fully aware. He abides in equanimity towards that, mindful and fully aware. That is how one is a noble one with developed faculties. Okay, so in this particular one, uh, you're developing uh, uh, more like a sort of a conscious uh, wish to be able to see things in different ways. So you can, if something's uh, uh, attractive to you, you can you can look on the the, the bad side of it and 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 see it as as repulsive. Um, uh, so you know, if I if I think with long with nostalgia back to my 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 days of fame and glory as a as a rock god. Then I can think of the the reality of of the 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 smell of the carpet in the pub uh, on, on a hot afternoon when you come in to set up for the sound check. And that's usually somewhat effective, and um, <laughs> uh, so similarly, uh, if something's disagreeable. Uh, then you can think of that as agreeable. And so, you know, you do that, for example, if there's maybe, say, a person who you find very annoying gets on your nerves, then you can reflect to yourself, okay, well, look, this person is, is, is suffering or this person uh, has, you know, different good, good qualities and so on and so forth. And by reflecting on that way, then you uh, overcome that sense of aversion and so on for the different uh, kinds of one. And, of course, the highest, as we noted before, the highest is, is simply to have the equanimity where you avoid those kinds of responses completely. But isn't it this one that is saying at the end that this is one with somebody who had already developed... A noble one with developed faculties, yeah. Faculties. So it's like someone already developed rather than just a second. Uh, right, yeah. So that, that certainly sounds like it's talking about an arahant. Yeah. Normally a noble one with developed faculties... Would sound that would I would assume that it would be an arahant, but he, clearly it's 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 saying that there arises what's agreeable and disagreeable. It sounds like they have got you know desire and hatred towards things. Um, but but before we go on to make too much conclusion about that, remember that the headings is one of the things which is different in the Chinese version. So let's have a look and see how that uh, differs before going to uh, too much uh, 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 giving too much drawing too much conclusions from that. So the Madhyamanikaya version uh, blah, 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 next turns to the disciple in higher training. On the path, it becomes, dis- again, back to Analio's comparative study, uh, the, um, uh, the, the disciple in higher training on the path who becomes disgusted with sense experience uh, and the Sangyukta Agama version has a similar treatment as the last of its three topics. Okay, again, see this sequence. Um, and the third and last topic in the Majjhima Nikaya version is to be a noble one with developed faculties, which requires one to be requires to be able to view the agreeable as disagreeable, the disagreeable as agreeable, etc., and to go beyond what is agreeable or disagreeable and dwell in equanimity. Uh, elsewhere, this uh, practice is called the Arya Idhi. Is is practice is taught is taught elsewhere in the suttas in Gutra fives. Uh, and in the Patisambhida Magga is called the Arya Idhi, the Noble One's psycho- Psychic Power. Um, okay. Uh, the corresponding treatment in the Chinese and the Sangyukta Agama version discourse is the first of the three topics to be taken up. Introduced under the heading "The Supreme Development of the Faculties," which, of course, in the Pali is the, the heading used for the first one, equanimity. 
Um, the Sangyukta Agama version differs from the corresponding treatment in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya discourse by having a, the, the, the Buddha as, his, as its object, having a Buddha as its subject, and by, sorry, as its subject, and by working through a somewhat different pattern. This pattern is as follows. So this is the Chinese version. Repulsion towards pleasing objects, no repulsion towards displeasing object, repulsion and no repulsion towards pleasing and displeasing, no repulsion and repulsion towards displeasing and pleasing, and equanimity towards pleasing, displeasing and pleasing and displeasing objects. And I'm sure you've got all that. Uh, and the Pali is somewhat different. So in sum, underlying that overall pattern of the Indriya Bhavana Sutta, a gradual build-up may be discerned, which proceeds through the following topics. Initial insight into the conditioned nature of sensory input experienced as agreeable and disagreeable, discussed with this evaluative mode of experiencing sensory data of the disciple in higher training, and the full mastery of reactions in regard to sense experience by an accomplished one who has fully developed his faculties. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, Analyo notes another, a couple of suttas which are parallel to this. The pattern in the Sangyukta Agama version instead does not seem to have such an underlying progression. Our main steps are in brief the stage of the Tathagata, the development of the faculties, and the discussed with sense experience of the disciple in higher training. From the viewpoint of textual transmission, says Venerable Analyo, it is noteworthy that both versions begin with the supreme development of the faculties as their first topic, although they differ on what type of treatment should be associated with this heading while the Madhya Nikaya version presents a set of similes illustrative of the establishment of equanimity at each sense door under the supreme development of the faculties. Uh, the Sangyukta Agama version makes use of a similar set of similes when ex examining the noble one with developed faculties. The supreme development of the faculties in the Sangyukta Agama discourse then develops the Madhya Nikaya's exposition of how to be a noble one with uh, developed faculties. And so notice that the um, Analios suggested uh, uh, way of uh, progress uh, is similar to uh, Venerable An uh, Dhammananda's uh, suggestion here. Um, oh, hence, although the two versions agree on beginning their overall treatment with the same heading as the first of three topics during the course of transmission, a whole section has apparently been displaced within the discourse and has been separated from its original heading. In spite of this displacement, the presentation in both versions is similar, a treatment that both conclude with an emphatic exhortation by the Buddha to meditate and thereby put his teaching into practice. We haven't read that bit yet. So the finishing off. So and under the supreme development of the faculties in the noble one's discipline has been taught by me, the disciple in higher training who has entered upon the way has been taught by me, and the noble one with developed faculties has been taught by me. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them, that I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda. Do not delay, or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That's what the Blessed One said. Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And so I, I hardly uh, imagine that it's a coincidence that these are the last words in the Madhyama Nikaya. Jayata. Etani Ananda Rukamulani Etani Sunyagarani Jayatananda Practice jhanas Mapamarata Do not be negligent Ma Pacha Vipati Sarino Ahu Vata Do not regret it later I am Wo Amhakang Anusasananti This is our uh, dispensation to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And Analia concludes his essay here, uh, due to their uh, similarities and differences, the, the uh, Pali Indriya Bhavana Sutta and its Sanyukta Agama parallel, in a way form a fitting conclusion to this series of comparative studies. Comparison of these two versions shows that at least one of them has suffered from a substantial sequential alteration during transmission. This alteration not only has caused a change in the overall sequence, but has also resulted in associating the three main parts of the exposition with different headings. In, at the same time, in spite of their variations, the Pali Indriya Bhavana Sutta and its Sangyukta Agama parallel present closely similar teachings. And of course, this being the, the, the um, uh, pattern which we've seen repeated countless times, uh, well, when I say countless times, I mean precisely 152 times in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, that the suttas uh, do differ sometimes in the sequence and details, uh, but the overall teachings is the same. I do have to say that the it's my, my overall impression is that this particular wagga, this this salayatana uh, wagga, is um, seems to be more different, more variant compared to the Chinese on average than most of the other suttas in the in the Majjhima Nikaya, and I, I would attribute that to, as I mentioned before, the the uh, suggestion that it was originally a, a, a group of ten suttas in the Sangyukta Agama, which was taken out of there and padded out to become big and diverse enough to be uh, have a place in the Majjhima Nikaya. And during that process, uh, certain um, uh, confusions and changes and so on happened. Uh, so, But even, even in that case, uh, there's hardly any, uh, if any at all, uh, significant doctrinal changes. It's merely a matter of the change in the, the sequence uh, and sometimes the particular content of what's included in one sutta or another sutta. Uh, yeah, uh, well, they use it for, for lamps, yeah, burning and shining, which also have similar, but they have a similar meaning. I wouldn't actually say that that's a literal meaning. They're actually different roots, which have the same, they share the same form in Pali, but in Sanskrit, they're different roots. The, the root jhana actually originally has, had, a, had, a, had a, as far as I can trace, the, the root of, of jhana is, is um, dhi in the um, uh, in the Vedas, uh, which uh, had a meaning of something like um, D had a meaning of uh, um, uh, almost like prayer, up, uplifted, uplifted thought. What do you want to search? Yeah, the the root is the root for Pali. The root for um, the the ultimate Pali root is D, which I don't think we're going to get. Sounds good with D. Here we go, Veda base. There you go, excellent. So this is the, and these. Oh, this is great. This is the actual. Okay, so these are from the Shatapata Brahmana and the the BG whatever BG is Bhagavad Gita. Oh, so that's quite late. But it's found quite commonly in the Vedas. I'm not sure why we're not getting Vedic ones here. Dhi mata, very intelligent. Dhi matang, those endowed with great wisdom. Sarva dhi vritti, process of realization by all sorts of intelligence. So they're translating dhi here as intelligence. 
So this is in the Bhagavad Gita and the Shatapata Brahmana Jaladhi by oceans. Mm. Uh, D for the intelligence, mana sarira D, uh, D mate, D mate, D mate, no, D mate, the intelligent, by a D from the ocean of milk. Interesting, there's a milk connection coming in here, the ocean, ocean, oh, sorry, ocean connection. Maybe that's probably a different word though. It looks like it's a short I, D man, intelligent, the functioning of the mind, intelligent, intelligent, intelligent. So, uh, in these texts, the Shatapara Brahmana is pre-Buddhist. What's this one? Sri Chaitana. It must be a later text of some kind. Um, then it's trans translating it here as intelligence, uh, which is somewhat, somewhat, somewhat missing the point a little bit. It, it often has, um, it often has a. He often has a, a quite an exalted um, uh, like an like an uplifting uh, um, sense, and the class the 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 uh, the, the greatest uh, context of that is the uh, the, the Gayatri. So the Gayatri is um, Gayatri is is one of the most popular of all the mantras used in Hinduism, uh, still very popular today, uh, and one of the uh, one of the relatively small number of elements of Hinduism which is actually traced traceable back to the Vedas, I believe. Um, so the Gayatri Ombur Burvaswa Tatsavitur Varenyang Bhargo Devasya Dimahi Dhyo Yonah Prachodayat, which means Ombur um, Burvaswa is uh, homage to the the earth, uh, the, the the ground, the being, and um, and the heavens. Tatsavitur Varenyang that that glorious uh, rising sun. Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi, um, to whose uh, Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi is the uh, uh, who uh, to, to homage to that. So go on. Who illuminates? Yeah, but I'm trying to translate Bhargo Devasya. Devasya is a divine who illuminates with divine uh, intelligence. The Dhima. Sorry. Ebullience, brilliance. brilliance, something like that. Yeah, brilliance. Yeah, brilliance is good. Dhyo yo nach prachodayat. So and whose 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 d, right? So this is the root, the same root as jhana comes from. Whose d, whose intelligence, but intelligence is not really adequate. Whose brilliance, whose 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 is impelling. So whose this is where prachodayat is to impel or to uplift. So it's like saying it's a, the idea is is that that it's like a homage to the sun which is rising and which is it's like this the 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 the, the, the infinite glory of the rising sun inspires our mind towards illumination. Something like that is what it's saying. Yeah. The seed symbol of the Bodhisattva wisdom and Jishu is D. Okay. Yeah, which may or may not be related. It quite possibly is. Yeah. And that's the root of the word jhana, yeah. So you're saying that the, it's not just burning, but it's no, like burning is actually burning is actually a separate root in Sanskrit. They just happen to have the same form in Pali. Yeah, this doesn't it doesn't actually etymolo etymologically have anything to do with burning. It's just a coincidence. Oh, so the, the explanation that it's the actual beauty is burning the defilements is not true. Well, that's just just an, ex an etymological explanation, but it's not the actual etymology of it. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I will make you can make some research. <laughs> oh, look! It's 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 a well studied, highly well known technical term in 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 uh, uh, in the Vedas and Indian stuff, and I've, I've 
it has a very straightforward etymology from D to Dhyana. In Sanskrit, is Dhyana, and the I becomes a Y. And so etymologically, it's very straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, the, the root jha is root for jhana in Pali, but the Sanskrit root is from, of course, dhyana, mm -hmm. and dhyana comes from the, the root dhi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dhi, Proto Indo Aryan verb. Oh, here we have Proto Indo Aryan. Oh, excellent. So here's the um, Proto Indo European. Sanskrit verb dhyai, adhyai, Proto Indian, Indo European verb di, Sanskrit adhyai or dhyai. Ah, curious. It's just linking to itself. So it's giving an, a Proto Indo European root for it. Uh, Receive. Uh, There's anything in the Pali dictionary. So, yeah, from Jayati, uh, Buddhist Sanskrit, Dhyana. The popular etymology is given by Buddha Gosa as um, it's called Jhana from its meditation on objects and from burning up anything adverse. So, because it burns up. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, okay, so it gives various things, but it doesn't give anything about the etymology. Jayati gives more details of that. Jayati is Sanskrit Dhyayati D. Dhira D from Dhyati shine, perceive. He says he's cunning, meaning to meditate, contemplate, think over, brood over. The next one should be And then the next entry. Jayati two, Sanskrit kshayati to burn, kshay and kshi, charika to burn, to be on fire, to be consumed, to waste away, to dry up, jalati, jayati, and so on. So it's uh, etymologically is two different words from two different roots. So Buddha Buddha is the most famous one. It's quite. Yeah, accurate. Quite inaccurate, yes. Accurate. No, that's what we've just shown, that there, there are two different etymologies, I eh? The word jhana doesn't have anything to do with burning up, but it's just used as a pun in the Pali, but it's not an actual etymology. So it's the same root as dhira? Dhira, yeah. Right. You are. Absolutely. Yeah. See if there's anything in the um, uh, the the usage of it in 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 the um, uh, in in the Vedas is extremely interesting actually. Um, Williams, because it. Uh, Uh, because it, it, it does have this meaning of um, mm, uh, it does have this this, this 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 sense like you see in the Gayatri mantra where 
um, where you I mean no matches for D it's ridiculous oh, thank you very much Input. it does have a um, Does, it has uh, this, is, this is very much the sense of, of 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 a mind state which is which is developed like a pure sort of exalted mind state which is to be developed these associations with light like it's even even in that sense it's not literally meaning burning but it's still associated with the sun and the sun is that which is impelling the brightness and the clarity of consciousness so it's like saying this sun is is our inspiration and so it's like the kind of the day is made magical and is made spiritual by uh, by the inspiration of the sun, which is raising up our our dhi. and so it still very much it has this kind of um, uh, idea of uh, the the connection with the de mental development, uh, which um, is uh, such an important intrinsic part of the uh, uh, Pali term. So if you've got mercy, it's giving us everything. It's ridiculous. This is giving us everything. Substring. Prefix. Dun, dun. Okay, it's a bit better. Mm, it's still not good. Oh, my goodness, exact. It doesn't give us anything. Fix. Mm. I don't know how to get a proper. Yes. Maybe it's just listed under the channel. And so here's the Sanskrit dictionary. Dihata dihana and dihai. Thinking. Thinking, meditation. <laughs> so thinking, meditation. So in the Sanskrit it always has that. It's a different one, 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 so again, this is root here, dihayati, dihay, and so on. To think of, imagine, contemplate, meditate on, call to mind, recollect. So still strongly connected with all of these mental terms, manasa, chetasa, hridaya, and so on. To brood mischief against. Yeah? Yeah, you find... <laughs> yes, that's a particular kind of meditation, which... Uh, yes. Uh, yes, that's true. You find you find occasionally these kind of negative ideas of dhyana. So let the head hang down, instead of an animal, dhyayati. Yeah. So, uh, but in the, again, in the Pali, you find like the animals, the donkeys meditating on its food. So dhyana, dhyata, nearly thought of dhyata not far. It's not as inspiring. No, it's not as inspiring. No. Dhyana, meditation, thought, reflection, especially profound and abstract religious meditation, uh, blah, 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 with Buddhists divided into uh, four stages. Um, uh, that's going to give us good. There's an actual text. That's not giving us dharmas, dharma sangraha. Yeah, you do find the, the four... Jhana is mentioned occasionally in Hinduism, but not really a standard group.
Anyway, so that's that. So anyway, the, the, the upshot of all that etymology is meditation is a good thing and you should do lots of it. So regardless of the etymology, that, that still remains the same, yes. <clears throat> Oh, definitely, yeah. Definitely, yeah. And it, it historically was used that way and is used occasionally in, in the Pali in that way. But, you know, most of the time, of course, in Pali, it was it's, it's definitely, I think, it was the Buddha who, 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 who restricted the usage mostly specifically to that group of four jhanas. You don't find the four jhanas mentioned as such in any pre-Buddhist pre texts. Uh, you do find them referred to once or twice in things like the Mahabharata. But then the Mahabharata by its own admission, tries to include everything it possibly can. Um, so, yeah, but definitely in an earlier time. It seems like in the Vedas it, it had this sense of the, the inspired thought, like a spiritual or uplifting thought, um, which, is, which is already quite interesting because in, and it's actually there was, a, there was a, a, uh, an in-depth study of that by a lady called Velkar, I believe. Um, I think the book is in the Buddhist library, perhaps. Anyway, I got the, I borrowed the book from somewhere, um, and what what she was showing was that even in the earlier stages of the the Vedas, that even though the Vedas are often said to be purely about ritual and so on, and not to have any meditative or contemplative aspect to them, but she showed, I think, quite clearly that there was a quite a quite a strong and profound uh, reflective and contemplative aspect in the Vedas, not to mention the later Upanishads and so on, but even in the Rig Veda itself. And one of the main words was this word dhi, which is already clearly being used in the sense of a, a mental state which is to be developed through doing spiritual practices. Uh, and, you know, mentioned many times and emphasized quite strongly. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's the seeds, at least of one aspect of meditation, are already present there within the Rig Veda. Yeah, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. How Well, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. I mean, of course, he, he, he always adapted the meaning and changed it according to his own. He was never trapped in the usage. He was very conscious how he used words and would, would, would redefine things very often according to his own uh, meaning. But but the but the interesting thing is not to me the interesting thing is not the difference because of course there's a difference but to me the interesting thing is that like if if you look at at at, at um, comparable literature to the Vedas in terms if you look say at um, the Iliad and, and the Odyssey for for example the Iliad even the Odyssey is much later but the Iliad is of a comparable date to the Rig Veda and there's almost no recognition or mention of mental states at all in the Iliad. And certainly, no idea that there are that there's like a contemplative or religious dimension to spiritual or to religious life, which you can develop uh, through contemplative practices. Of so that idea is completely absent from anything like the Iliad or any any other Western scriptures. Uh, you know, even though they're both drawing on the same cosmology, right? So the Rig Veda and the Iliad are both sharing the same Indo-European cosmology and much of the same linguistic basis, but that aspect of it. Is just completely absent. There's nothing even vaguely like it. Uh, so, uh, you know, to me that's very interesting and curious about how that uh, became introduced in the specifically the Indian tradition. Now we've, we've traced the etymology of dhi back to uh, a, 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 a psychological term and a psychological term which is already quite a sophisticated psychological term, right? It's not just a word for thought in an ordinary sense. It's a word for a particular kind of mental development that's appropriate within a spiritual sense. And that's already quite a sophisticated idea. And uh, it must have older roots and it must have a, have a more simple or more basic meaning in older texts, but I haven't, haven't come across that. I don't know whether that's traceable. And I don't know whether there's any, like we just saw the Proto-Indo-European roots and they haven't traced it any further back. Perhaps it just doesn't exist in other forms. If, it do, if, it's not found, if there's no cognates found in English, and I'm not aware that it does have cognate found in English or other 
uh, Western languages, then perhaps it might even have been uh, adopted from the local Indian languages rather than being uh, Indo-European. One possibility. Anyway, okay, so with that, any more questions? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, I'd like to um, bring this final sutta class to a close. So now we've finished the 152 suttas of the Majjhima Nikaya. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. So now we should all go back and read them all again. <laughs> Okay, and and if for, we've been reading uh, from Analio's uh, studies, and we've been reading the Sutta uh, excerpts, but also to mention that he does also have excellent introduction and conclusion, which we haven't read. So if you haven't read those, uh, you definitely should, because he draws together uh, a lot of the strands and ideas that have emerged through that uh, massive research project that he undertook. So uh, do yourself a favour. Okay. Oh.